Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Dave Lubnick with YCharts, and I'm happy to welcome Nick Kalivas from Invesco. We're happy that you could join us here this afternoon. Invesco has been a great partner of YCharts for several years now, and we're excited that Nick has uh, found an hour in his time to join us to go through his outlook for 2022. Uh, with Invesco, YCharts has had a great partnership as their distribution team is leveraging the tool um, for their conversations with advisors like many of you. And in addition to working with asset managers, YCharts also works with thousands and thousands of advisors as a research, market data, and client communication tool, especially as it relates to portfolios and presentations. Uh, I'm excited to have Nick walk us through his outlook on 2022. Can the bull market continue and where he sees it going from here? And just a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have any questions along the way, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of Zoom that you can leverage to input questions. We'll try to get to all those at the end of the presentation. And also, if you are interested in more information on YCharts, I encourage you to visit us at YCharts.com to start a free trial, or you can email us at hello at YCharts.com. We've got a special little discount in there for anybody who signs up in the month of November uh, as a result of this webinar. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Nick, to take us through your outlook. All right, thanks, Dave. It's a real pleasure to be here. So let me kind of just give you a, an agenda on where we're gonna go. First, what we're gonna do is start uh, to just take a look at where the money's been flowing. I think that's important from kind of a sentiment and, and maybe from a contrary standpoint. Then I'm gonna dust off the crystal ball and we're gonna to try to look at a number of economic indicators that will give us some direction on where corporate profit growth and uh, the equity market may go. I will say a few words about inflation because that's a, a big topic and it can clearly uh, impact stock prices. And then we'll we'll talk a little bit about the concentration present in the market and the valuation and, and maybe uh, think a little bit about how to manage that. And then uh, we'll have some just uh, wrap up concluding thoughts. So the first um, thing I want to talk about is, is the, the, the trend in factor ETF flows. And um, if you look at this chart, it's going to kind of break down what we saw in the first half of the year in the light blue, and then the back half of the year through October 8th and, and kind of the, the darker black. And so what do you want to get out of this slide? I, I think there's a couple things. I mean, first of all, is there's been a persistent interest in market cap weighted strategies. I think a lot of that has to come with their success in terms of return. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with just um, investors wanting exposure to stocks. If you dig a little bit deeper, what you'll see is that early in the year, there was a tremendous interest in value, but that kind of faded out uh, in the second half of the year. You've actually seen a little bit more interest in growth. And that was uh, coinciding with um, kind of the uptick in the COVID cases and, and worries about slower growth. You've seen persistent interest in dividend, uh, but that has been more on the growers as opposed to the yielders. And the, the growers um, tend to be a little bit more market-like. And in terms of defense, uh, defensive types of strategies, you've seen very little interest uh, in that. People have been playing offense. So there's been kind of this persistent outflow uh, from uh, uh, low volatility, uh, min volatility. You might look a little bit and, and note that there's been um, some interest in, in, in equal weight uh, strategies or, or size strategies present, not much interest in, in momentum uh, or really uh, mega cap. So with that, let's let's look a little bit at uh, sector flows. And um, it, it's, it's, there's a similar theme or story here. Very early in the year, energy and financials saw a lot of flow. That was the recovery. That was a reopening trade. And then it tailed off uh, in the second part. Um, Technology has been consistent, but, but fairly small. Communications uh, services, strong a little bit recently here, and healthcare, but certainly nothing of a great magnitude. And this might go back to this idea that investors are just kind of more blanketly allocating uh, to stocks. So now that you've kind of uh, seen where the, uh, the flow and the money's been going, uh, let's, let's dust off the crystal ball and let's talk about uh, some indicators. And, and the first thing I want to get across in this chart, and this shows uh, the price of the S&P 500 and, uh, and then um, earnings for the S&P 500. And when we think about the markets, you know, people talk about monetary policy, they talk about politics, they talk about geopolitics. I mean, there's all this noise that is out there. 
just focus on earnings. That's what tends to drive stock prices uh, with a very high correlation or explanation. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to try to do is just zero in on the things that influence uh, corporate profits. So anytime you're thinking about um, the market, think about earnings, try to analyze it through an earnings lens. So we'll start off with probably the most equity bullish chart here. And this is the, the monetary policy uh, chart. And it, it shows in the um, black the year-over-year -year change in S&P 500 earnings growth. And in the blue is the inflation-adjusted uh, federal funds rate. And that's kind of a proxy. The Fed uh, moves the federal funds rate around. That's kind of a proxy for their policy. And you can see that the Fed funds rate adjusted for inflation has tended to lead uh, earnings growth by about two years. Uh, it's not perfect. None of these relationships are, but it's, it's given us a good direction. And you can see the historically large amount of stimulus that, that is in place. I mean, this Fed funds rate is, is inverted here to kind of show the, the relationship, but you can see monetary policy really hasn't been this uh, stimulative since uh, the, the, the very early 80s, and this bodes well for profit growth uh, next year. Now, um, a little more sobering, but still uh, positive, is the inventory cycle. So what I have here is the rate of change on a 12-month basis of the inventory to sales ratio. That's in the dark, uh, dark line. And in the blue is earnings per share uh, for the S&P 500, a year-over-year -year change. And uh, the key here is that the inventory cycle tends to lead profit growth. And it makes a lot of sense because if inventories are falling, then you're likely to get production, employment, more output. If inventories are rising, then you, you get the opposite. Basically, people are cutting back. Again, I've inverted this so that you know when, when that black line is going up, you're actually seeing the inventory to sales ratio decline. And you can see that it's, it's actually starting to, to increase. Uh, and what does that mean? That means that corporate profit growth, as we kind of roll deeper into 2022, uh, is, is set to, to slow. So that's going to be a headwind to profit growth. How about the ISM new orders? This is another one of my kind of favorite leading indicators here. Now, this time we don't have to invert to scale. I mean, strong new orders tend to lead corporate profit growth by about nine months. Um, and you can see that new orders are historically high. Um, they're starting to, to, to flatten out. Um, they'll probably start to roll over as it just gets tougher to stay at the top of the cycle here. But this is, this is pretty good news. So this kind of goes in that monetary policy uh, bucket uh, in terms of being very stimulative for growth as we go into 2022. And it's really the back half uh, where you might get much more concerned about uh, what's going on. Now uh, we have uh, uh, the dollar. Uh, the dollar is a good indicator um, in terms of influencing corporate profits. And in the black, what I have is a trade weighted dollar and it's um, uh, pushed forward by three quarters. Uh, so it, we're look, trying to use it as a leading indicator here. We're taking the rate of change and on this graphic, it is inverted again. So when you see the, the black line rising, that actually means the dollar is falling. Uh, when you see the black line declining, that means the dollar is rising. Uh, you can see the dollar has been starting to strengthen here. And so that's going to start to create a little bit of a headwind uh, to corporate profit growth. And I'll just remind you, you know, when we have a weak dollar, it's, it's you know, the, our U.S. goods are cheaper. It's much, um, uh, you know, it's easier for uh, foreigners to buy our goods. So that's good. Uh, for, for profits and sales. Likewise, when money gets repatriated back, uh, corporations repatriate their money back for reporting purposes, they can buy a lot more dollars when the dollar is weak and, 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 and they're owning those stronger foreign currency uh, values here. So that's the logic that goes, be, uh, goes behind this slide. Now, in terms of um, capital spending, this is another good uh, predictor. So I use the Philadelphia Fed uh, outlook uh, uh, numbers uh, to get a picture of capital spending. Uh, a couple quarters forward here, you can see that in the black, uh, tends to follow corporate profits, tends to lead corporate profits. And again, you can see this number is very, very high and uh, starting to, to fade a little bit here, but, but this is kind of top of the cycle. 
uh, but you know, still very good for, for profit growth as we enter uh, 2022. Um, this slide is just gives us a little bit of an idea on, on runway. And I, I bring it up because what we have in the, in the purple here is industrial production. What we have in um, the orange is uh, earnings per share for the S&P 500. And you can see they're, they're pretty uh, tightly correlated, especially at the peaks and the troughs. Uh, but what's interesting here is industrial production really has gone nowhere since the financial crisis uh, back there in 2008. Uh, and uh, we're still below kind of the, the prior peak by about 4%. So on an absolute basis, if you're just kind of looking at the earnings per share numbers, um, there's runway for it to continue to rise. So even though that rate of change is going to slow, you can still uh, see earnings um, rise. And, and that's good news for stock prices. So um, before I finish up on the earnings section, I think this slide is very valuable because it shows the earnings estimate changes for the major uh, indexes uh, that that um, that we watch, and um, you can see those estimates have been rising all year long, which probably explains why the market is is pretty strong, and we haven't had these kind of you know major gut wrenching corrections. But it, no, you'll notice that the smaller cap spectrum is actually seeing much faster profit growth uh, than the larger cap spectrum, and I, I think that's interesting because uh, small caps have really struggled here. Uh, you know, since the first couple months of the year, they've just been chopping uh, sideways. And um, I, I do think that um, this is something that suggests there, there is some, some value in the smaller cap spectrum. And I also think it's something that explains why the market has been so strong uh, in terms of its uh, uh, price action. So um, let's take a, 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 a now just kind of a step back and look at kind of the broader cycle so we can get a little bit more uh, insight into uh, what, um, what might happen next year. Because if I were to sum up those, those other slides, I think what I wanted to do is paint a picture of the fact that, you know, profit growth is likely to slow next year, but it looks like it's still going to be pretty strong, pretty supportive to, to stock prices. And that sets this kind of positive backdrop. Now, when we dig into the cyclical influences here, you'll see that we'll probably get more corrections, more risk. It's not going to be as easy uh, or as comfortable as it was this year. So what I have here is the ISM manufacturing index, and I take the rate of change of that over the last year. So just think a one-year rate of change. And I do the same for the price of the S&P 500 in, in, in the black. And you'll, you'll see these are pretty decently correlated to one another. But as the ISM rolls over and starts to weaken, stock price gains tend to slow down. Um, so given where we are in the cycle, that ISM number is you know, pretty elevated historically in the 60 area. It's likely to start working its way lower on a, on a comp basis, on a historical basis. And that's going to lead to slower stock price appreciation next year. And really, this graphic right here, I think, tells us a lot about what to expect or how to think about the cycle. So what I did here is uh, break out um, the, uh, the ISM by, by kind of buckets. So you think about less than 50 and rising, 50 to 55 and rising, over 55 and, and rising. So that's kind of when the economy is on an upswing. And then the different buckets when he, for the ISM is at, at different stages, but falling. So you can think about the economy starting to slow down when it's 55 uh, and over and falling, uh, 50 to 55 and falling, and less than 15 falling. So that's kind of the, the contraction or recessionary uh, area here, that last, um, that last bucket. But let's, let's take a look at how, historically speaking, the S&P 500 has performed in these buckets. So we go all the way to the right. These are the monthly average returns. And what you see is when that ISM is rising, those returns tend to be much better when the, than when the ISM is falling. They get much smaller. Matter of fact, they get really small if you're under 50 uh, and, and, and falling. And so as we start to roll over, 
the gains for the S and P are likely to be harder fought. They're not going to be as as big, um, and because right now we're really in this greater than fifty five and a falling bucket. I mean, the cycle hasn't changed. I can only really evaluate that in retrospect, but you know that's where we seem to be right now. Now let's talk a little bit about a couple of other indicators because I think this is is interesting. Um, you'll notice that ten year Treasury yields tend to increase when the ISM is rising. And they tend to fall at the percentage change of that yield on an average on an average monthly basis tends to decline when that ISM is declining. Um, and so even though interest rates are very low, and I think all our feelings is that they should rise, I mean, I think that's conventional wisdom, and certainly valuation would argue for that. Um, historically speaking, when the ISM declines, yields decline. So it's going to be an interesting battle as the Fed tapers and we see some cyclical headwinds and how that all works out. But that this is the history here. Um, you'll also note that high yield spreads tend to rise. So there's more credit risk present as the ISM is falling. Uh, and you know that's the flip of what we see when the ISM is rising, that credit spreads tend to narrow a lot. And then lastly, let's just talk a little bit about equity volatility here, kind of the third column over from the right. This is the VIX, uh, which we all know and love. And you can see that when that ISM is rising, the VIX tends to uh, fall a lot or not show a lot of gain. Uh, but when that um, ISM is falling, especially uh, under 55 and falling, that's where we start to get higher VIX levels. So then, you know, volatility in the equity market goes up. And that makes sense as the economy starts to slow down. So you can think about this as uh, you know, kind of a, a, a picture on where risk might go, where stock prices might go. You know, and my conclusion from this slide is we get deeper into 2022, um, you see sl slower stock appreciation, you see a more volatility, you probably see a little bit of widening of, of, of credit spreads, you'll see a little more risk uh, uh, present. And it's an interesting thing, because when we went back to that, um, that uh, the flow slide, you see nobody was in like a low volatility strategy or minimum volatility strategy. Everybody's been taking risk, which will be interesting to see how that manifests itself in, in 2022, whether there's more interest for strategies that are that are more defensive in, in nature. Now, um, let's take a little bit of look at in, inflation here. Um, when you uh, look at this slide, this is looking at the jolts data that, that we get um, you know, every month. So kind of job openings turnover. Uh, in the blue is the ratio of opening to hiring. And in the kind of the black is wage and salary growth. And I tried to push uh, the jobs opening numbers about three months, about a quarter forward. So it'd be predictive. You know, that seemed to make some sense between 2002 and about 2018. The pandemic seems to have kind of messed that up. But nonetheless, the takeaways from this slide are that the labor market is super tight. We all know that. This is just kind of a picture of it. But that wage growth tends to be elevated or strong, even though it might decelerate some, still pretty high. And that's a risk to corporate profit margins. So let's take a look at another angle here on uh, wages and um, look at it through the lens of the small business confidence number that comes out every month. This is compensation plans uh, that the small business owners uh, reveal in the survey, and that's in the dotted line. Um, I push that forward a year so it can be predictive of where hourly average hourly earnings are right now. And that's the, the blue line. And you can see pretty decent relationship uh, there. But you can also see that compensation plans are historically high. You got to go back. You know, really, this is historic on the chart. Um, and it tends to argue for hourly earnings to, to increase as we go into 2022. And so this could again, be an argument for a higher cost for companies, and it presents a risk to margins. And that's this graphic right here, which shows the S&P 500 profit margin against average hourly earnings. And um, you can see that they, they somewhat tend to track together just because when the economy's strong, you know, uh, wages are strong and, and corporate profits are strong. But what um, you also see here is after periods where um, hourly where hourly earnings have been strong, in the ensuing periods after that, we tend to see margin compression. 
So there might be some kind of cyclical uh, relationships here that are that are in place. But I, I do think the very high wages uh, growth that's taking place is a risk to margins. And um, I, I think it's something that we we really uh, need uh, to watch, given the, the history uh, of this chart and the fact that when inflationary pressures have gotten very, very high in the ensuing periods, it's it's been trouble for um, uh, uh, profit uh, margins and, and, and obviously profit growth too. Um, I also want to just point out a little bit uh, industrial commodity prices, and this is interesting in that you know, and, and the stuff here in industrial commodity prices. I mean, this is not oil or natural gas. This is like copper, hides, resin, all that kind of stuff that that very industrial. And you can see it's it's historically elevated, kind of new highs for uh, industrial commodity prices. The rate of change has been very high. It's starting to slow down as we go up against, uh, you know, levels that were that were higher from a year earlier. But it too underscores the inflation risk that 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 is uh, present. Um, we'll we'll, we'll uh, uh, get close to the end here on inflation. Just taking one look at capacity use against the core CPI. Um, here, if you look back in the 1970s, 80s. You could see clearly when capacity use went up, inflationary pressures went up. In recent years, I think the advent of technology, the change of the economy, the impact has been muted or, or less profound. But nonetheless, capacity use is still pretty low. Um, and as it goes up, as it rises, um, and, and let's say it goes back and tests where we were uh, a couple of years ago, that could put some upward pressure on inflation. Um, on home prices, just a quick note, um, when we think about CPI, uh, the one thing that, um, that, that, that comes out is, 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 is this, the way home prices and, and rents are really measured in the CPI. And what I find very fascinating here is that you know, owner equivalent rents, rents of primary residence, you know, the, the, that they're about 23 and seven and a half percent of the CPI. So they're really big components of inflation. Like you're not going to see a lot of sustained inflation unless there's some upward pressure on those rents. But if you look at the blue line, this is the Case Schiller uh, Home Price Index. And you can see that, you know, this this number was up almost 20 percent year over year in, in August. It's very, very elevated. Uh, it, it suggests there's a lot of inflation in terms of housing and, and rents. And um, that hasn't really shown up in a major way in, in the CPI housing numbers yet. And it almost looks to some degree that the, those housing numbers are very kind of smooth in the CPI, maybe a little bit void of reality. But it's a little bit, I guess, editorializing on the CPI. But, it, but this is certainly something to keep an eye on in terms of inflation rising on a CPI level, you know, we start to see some of those big home price appreciations start to leak into the CPI. And then lastly, on this section, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, 10-year Treasury yields. Historically low when you adjust them for uh, inflation. Haven't seen them this low since really the early 1980s. And this drives home the point that there's nowhere to put your money other than stocks or alternatives. Okay? So when, you know, when people think about you know, uh, Bitcoin or when they think about real estate uh, or they think about land, I mean, this, this is why, because there's just no real return on, uh, on treasuries uh, or fixed income returns are very, very low. And this is something that I would deem uh, positive for, for the stock market, uh, given, uh, given, given the, the relative valuations. So let's, let's kind of take this and, and dive a, a bit into equity valuation and, uh, and, and, and concentration. So this first graphic uh, shows the historical price to earnings ratio of the S&P 500. Um, I kind of blotted out the, um, uh, the, the, the financial crisis and the tech bubble here. So you see those blanks and that's just because um, Earnings basically went from you know negative or nothing like write-offs to, to to nothing to the next year you know there was strong earnings and so you so that's why there's gaps there I I I think it's just an adjustment it doesn't 
really ruin the story of, uh, of, of what we're trying to say. Um, you can see that that longer term PE ratio, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, in the 16 area, that's the, the, the green dotted line, and then plus or minus one standard deviation, those are the red lines. So you can see that we're, 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 we're a bit elevated right now. When I looked at uh, some of the data from uh, Standard Poor's, uh, we're about 25. So we've come down a lot from the high that we saw kind of during the pandemic, but we're still very elevated here. And that high PE ratio is a bit of a headwind to the stock market because we don't have that much room for, for expansion in terms of we've got earnings growth. Are we going to be able to, to really expand uh, the PE from 25? It's on the higher end or the upper end of that, that range. Um, but there's things to think about when we, we talk about equity valuation. One, when earnings are growing, investors pay more for them, or they, they should pay more for faster growing earnings. And we really live in kind of an unprecedented time of innovation, uh, change. I mean, our standard of livings are so good. And I think that's reflected somewhat in, um, you know, that kind of the earnings growth, the earnings outlook, and probably explains some of that um, level relative to, let's say, the 40s or the 50s. Second of all, people tend to pay more for stocks when there's less leverage on the balance sheet. That The less leverage or less debt cuts down on the risk and tends to, to elevate the P-E ratio. And from a debt to equity ratio, the S&P is, is relatively low compared to what we've seen over the last 20 years. So there's not a lot of debt uh, being used. The story in the small and large is a little bit different. Uh, but certainly that's what we've seen in the, um, in the, in the S&P 500. And then lastly, we tend to pay more uh, for stocks when interest rates are low. That, that's kind of a natural uh, occurrence here. So um, there's your, your valuation from a historical perspective. Now let's look at it relative to the 10-year treasury yield. Now, this yield is not adjusted for inflation. It's just a 10-year treasury yield. And what you see is uh, on that x-axis the 10-year yield on the y-axis is the pe ratio for the s p 500. again i kind of took out the tech bubble uh because it just got a little bit uh kind of noisy in there but you can see that um in in some of the some of the earlier years you know 70s 80s pretty decent relationship between interest rates and pe ratios um as we get into the the last uh, 10 years or so, things have kind of loosened up a lot. As interest rates have gotten very, very low, that relationship has gotten a lot more noisy. So, you know, my takeaway from this slide, um, you know, especially you can see, look at where we are in the 2020s. Those are some, some booming type of, uh, of values, a lot of dispersion, um, and, and certainly in the 2010s, a lot of dispersion here, um, obviously kind of less so in the 1980s. Uh, we just didn't get that or even in, in, in the 1970s. So um, my takeaway from this is, yes, if interest rates rise, it will probably create some compression to valuations. It will create some um, uh, 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 pressure on the equity markets and cap. But as you can see, there's, there's a lot of variability in that. There's other things that are, that are going on in terms of what's happening with earnings growth. And so um, uh, this does not particularly scare me a lot. What really would scare me is if, if we saw interest rates rise and we saw uh, earnings grow slow. But, but here's a, a good historical picture on that uh, relationship. Now, let's talk a little bit about valuation here. Um, uh, so this is where we were at the end of uh, September. Now, we're almost at the end of October, but I, I, I looked at the data this morning and the story has not you know, changed uh, at all. Uh, so what we have here is we have the equal weight S&P 500 because we're trying to look at kind of the average stock uh, and we have the, the S&P 500 cap weighted um, and we have kind of their current um, forward PE, their price to sales ratio and their price to book ratio relative to the 10 year median. And then we have in these kind of gray uh, boxes, uh, we have uh, the, the percent difference. So kind of how much is, is, is the valuation different from what we've seen over the last uh, 10 years? 
And what you can see is that, you know, equal weight, the average stock, I mean, you can think about equal weight as just the average stock in the S&P 500 compared to cap weight, where now you've got a weighting uh, scheme by, by, by market cap. And now you're getting a lot more emphasis on those, those bigger names influencing the valuation. Um, only about 5% above the 10-year median. The S&P cap weight is 22%. Likewise, if we go to price to sales, here you're 38 percent. So that's that's um, that's that's a bit different. I mean, it's a little elevated. But when you think cap weight, you're 65. So really, a lot more extreme in terms of the valuation stretch. And then if you go to uh, price to book, it's 22 for equal weight, and it's 55 uh, for cap weight. And and that again is probably. Um, very big, but but certainly some of the bigger names in the S and P 500 do not have kind of that big asset base. They're they're you know more expensing R and D and and that whole story. So price to book explains that. And when I look at price to book, I, I discount that a bit because of that factor. But there's really no discounting price to sales or or price to earnings. And and this um, is interesting because when you go way back to where I started. We see all this money flowing into cap weight. We also see the valuation in cap weight relatively uh, elevated to, to its history. And I think that is a story that might help to, um, you know, allow you to think about other avenues to get your equity exposure where, where you don't have that concentration uh, risk presence. So let me kind of go a little bit deeper on the concentration risk com, uh, um, concept here. Um, if you look at this solid line, this is um, the percentage of the top 10 uh, names they're weighting in the S&P 500 over time. And right now at the end of, this was marked at the end of quarter three, 29.3%. I looked at it this morning. It's like 29.96%. like, we're almost at 30% here. So very, very high historically. You got to go back to the nifty 50s, uh, the nifty 50 in the 1970s to get this type of concentration. What's interesting is that when you look at concentration for the S&P 500, um, it changes over time. I mean, we've been on this kind of big concentration ramp up. Last time we saw this was kind of the, the, the 90s into you know, 1999, and then we compressed for a year. Um, what we find when you when you look at a lot of the data is that when you see the um, the concentration fall, like we did uh, from like let's say 2000 to 2014, that tends to be a very good time period for things like the value factor. So value stocks, it tends to be good for smaller stocks. It tends to be good uh, for equal weight. When it rises, um, it's really a market cap phenomenon. So you can see how much it's gone up. And in fact, I looked at the return of the top 10 names in the S&P over the last three years, and, and they account for a little more than 40% of the return of the S&P 500. When you looked at the bottom 250, so almost like the bottom half was just 3%. So um, we really see uh, heavy concentration, historic, uh, and it's good to be aware of that. It, the concentration goes up and down uh, depending on market conditions. The other issue, which I think is very interesting in terms of, 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 of trying to manage uh, risk, is the, the market cap. Uh, those 10 names uh, had $11.4 trillion in market cap. Um, if you put that in perspective, uh, the Japanese economy is five trillion in size. Uh, when I when I looked, uh, the the Chinese economy was uh, about fifteen trillion, and the U.S. was about twenty one trillion. So you have just a small number of, of names that are um, essentially uh, you know larger than 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 some major uh, economies, and it goes to this idea of again. If you're making a, a core of your portfolio, you want a core kind of durable holding. When, when you're in market cap, what's going to happen 
is you're going to be taking a lot of bets on some of these, these bigger names. And the law of large numbers becomes a factor. It's much harder to grow your company from $2 trillion to $4 trillion than it is from $500 million to, to, to a billion. So I, I like this chart just because it um, gives you some good history and, and makes you think a little bit, even though concentration has been very strong and very stubborn. Here's the leadership change that we've seen through time uh, for the S&P 500. And I, I, I love this chart because you'll notice that all the, the names that we see right now, like they, they didn't exist or they were lower on the market cap when you go back uh, you know, uh, you know, 50 years or, or 30 years. And when you go back to, to the 1970s or the 1980s and you look at those names, and you know, a lot of them don't exist anymore, uh, or they're much less uh, uh, dominant, and, and they don't show up. And so this just shows that over time, the, the deck can uh, 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 really shuffle. And what we see as, as dominant now, you know, may not be there uh, 10, 10 years from, from now. So a little history lesson um, and uh, or market history that I think is uh, it, that, that it is very uh, interesting. So a um, <clears throat> couple of, uh, of, of last slides before I, uh, I do the, the wrap up slide uh, here. Um, this is showing the PE ratio between uh, the S&P 600 and the S&P 500. So it's just a, a plain ratio of, uh, of the PE ratio, it's a forward PE ratio. And you know, what's, what's kind of the takeaway here? Well, um, really small, small stocks, the S&P 600 is the cheapest it's been relative to the S&P 500 uh, since the tech bubble. So small stocks are uh, inexpensive uh, there. Um, and you can see that that kind of con contracted to or, or, or reversed from the pandemic. And this is when you have these kind of, you know, shocks or, or economic recessions. Sometimes you get a little volatility uh, in the valuation measure. But if you roll back to that one graphic that I, I had where I showed the earnings estimates rising, um, what you saw there was that S&P 600 Earnings growth was was much stronger than what you saw in S and P 500 earnings growth estimate increases. Meaning they the analysts were taking up those estimates in the 600 much faster than than the 500. And you know one of the things I take away from this is is the small caps are cheaper, and they're actually have been seeing faster upward revision or stronger outlook for their earnings. And, and to me, that is um, a, a potential uh, opportunity, or at least it, it, it piques my interest and, and may be something that suggests, you know, smaller stocks have the potential possibility of having a better uh, 2022. Um, now, um, just a little bit on the, the, the spread between uh, small and large. So again, I took the S&P 600, divided it by the S&P 500, uh, you know, try to look a little bit at, at technical analysis here, just to get a picture of what's going on. And, and, and this is, uh, I, I think a little bit classic kind of uh, the technicals, but you can see the big run up from the fall of 2020, uh, all the way to uh, this uh, spring. Um, and, and since then, small caps have, have really lagged, and that's kind of the COVID cases uh, coming back. Uh, it is uh, the slower growth uh, worry and really this, you know, the, the earnings power and, and the excitement over many of those large cap uh, uh, growth names that have been present. But this is a pretty nice channel. Uh, and in fact, I think if you could get over the August highs, like clearly kind of break out of this channel, it would be a good sign. It could be a sign of a catalyst, could be a sign of a longer term uptrend for small uh, over large. I also drew in this um, dotted line here, uh, and that I think would be a little bit of support. So there's nothing to say that, you know, that ratio of the small caps can't go back down and test the bottom end of the channel again, or trade back into May um, you know, the, the highs we saw back in, uh, in, in, the, in the spring, summer 2020. But it, 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 to me, this is kind of a, a, a bit of a, a potential nice 
set up with some support underneath I, I, this channel, potentially leading to uh, uh, to 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 some um, potential upward momentum in small caps. So, little bit of fundamentals on valuation, little bit of fundamentals on upward earnings uh, at growth, and uh, a little bit of technical analysis. Uh, uh, mixed in together, and certainly this chart seems a little bit odd that that uh, smallest lag, given that upward revision to the to the earnings story. So with that, um, uh, let me uh, make a few uh, concluding statements here and, and try to summarize uh, what I said. Um, the first takeaway here is profit growth is expected to slow. Um, in, 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 in 2022. I think we're, we are peaking. I think it's about as good as it's going to get in this cycle. Uh, but you know, the world's not falling apart. Um, I think the current earnings estimates are you know, around 9% for the S&P 500. I think the NASDAQ 100 is a little bit higher. It's a little bit closer to 10, looking for growth next year. And when you looked at all those charts that I provided, um, that, that seems pretty reasonable here. Uh, it seems very, very reasonable. So underlying earnings look um, supportive of the stock prices. So uh, it, 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 I would expect 2022 to be a good year. You know, my fear, if there's some fear, it's really that political realm where let's say you have higher corporate taxes or there's some kind of geopolitical shock. Um, you know, that that's the kind of thing that could change behavior and maybe uh, adversely impact the, the profit view. Um, I think that the other thing that is, is present, and it goes back to that, that cycle chart that I had in terms of the ISM and the S&P 500 and the table, and that's is I would expect more volatility. I, I, I think this year was very, very docile. I mean, there have been, I think, three years since 1990 where the S&P was up more than 10% and we never saw a 5% correction. So it's not unprecedented that we see very strong stock prices with little um, uh, correction, but it's more the exception to the rule. I mean, there's a lot of years where we've been up 10%, you know, and had two or three kind of gut, gut checks. Um, and I think that's what 2022 is, is, is more likely to be like, um, you know, more volatility, uh, maybe a little bit wider credit risk all happens as, as the growth rate of earnings slows down, not, not catastrophic at all, but just it's just not as good or as unprecedented as, as we've seen kind of post um, a pandemic. In terms of the valuation, um, you know, they're lifted by low interest rates and, and nowhere to go. And I think it's interesting when you look at money market fund assets, they do rise over time, uh, but there's plenty of cash uh, on the sidelines here that, that, that could be put to work and that could really uh, underpin stocks, you know, likewise, a lack of alternative from uh, the uh, uh, from the um, uh, the low 10 year treasury yield. Um, and I would say too, one thing that's positive is just the the innovation uh, that that is just present. I mean, the, the change in technology, all the things that have happened, um, that supports valuation. And I think that gets people excited about stocks and, and, and grow stocks and you know, being part or investing in that kind of next thing. I mean, who knows exactly what it's going to be, but certainly data, AI, you know, machine learning, all these concepts are, are, are out there. Um, I think the, the, the thing is you just got to be a little bit careful on, um, you know, what price you are paying, but it's underneath uh, the market. It's, 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 it's supportive because it can lead to, you know, things that are, that are, uh, that are profound for, for more boring stocks. Um, and then the, the inflation risk, um, uh, I think it might be underpriced here. I mean, that's one of that's my biggest fear is that inflation stays high, um, margins get squeezed. It's harder for companies to pass on the price hikes. They have to absorb more, um, and, and that's I think something that is that that we have to watch, um, and, and certainly can be a factor that 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 raises uh, interest rates um, uh, as 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 a dynamic. Um, and then uh, the concentration issue, I, I think, is something we, you know, we just have to be cognizant of and, and aware of in terms of portfolio construction. Um, you know, the, the big, large cap, cap names, they, you know, their dominance, they create this kind of antitrust sentiment. Um, they, they create a lot of, uh, you know, political noise and, and hot air. 
But you know, when you're when you're long cap weight, you've got a lot of your your eggs in that basket, and um, there can be risk. And you've certainly seen that more, most risk recently here with uh, Facebook. Uh, it, top ten names change over time, uh, and then um, managing. Um, um, then I would say small. I'll, I'll finish up by saying small uh, stocks um, look uh, inexpensive uh, to large stocks. So down, think about going down the cap spectrum. Uh, from a kind of a valuation standpoint, um, even though you know some of those smaller cap stocks might not be as versatile uh, in terms of an inflationary environment as as, a, as kind of big uh, growth stocks, but maybe you go growth down the cap spectrum as a way to get around that. You know those companies that are that are you know are growers. They 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 are in businesses that are not as uh, sensitive to uh, input pressures. So that's what I really uh, had had to. Uh, to share here. So um, Dave, with that, maybe we can go to some Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Nick. That was great. I'll give you a chance to get a sip of water there. Um, first question we have uh, comes from what you kicked off the presentation with uh, related to fund flows. So I'll take this one. Um, the question was where you can find that fund flow information in Y charts. So um, there's a couple sources for that. First of all, in Y charts, you can search and, and find a lot of uh, information coming from the Investment Comp Company Institute (ICI). Um, they provide a lot of flow data at the asset class level, and then on a monthly basis, Y charts compiles fund flows across categories, sectors, industries, um, kind of across everything, um, and we disseminate that to clients on a monthly basis. So those those are available through PDF reports. Uh, that are great to dissect that data. Um, Nick, I'll turn it to you now for another question here related to what you're talking about, market cap weighted, equal weighted. I know Invesco um, is at the forefront of that thought leadership there and, and products that you've come out with in the ETF side. When you talk about small caps though, um, do you feel that the market cap and the equal weight is as important? Um, love to hear your thoughts on that related also maybe to you know, active management there. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, I mean, when you get into uh, equal weight, um, you do tilt uh, towards this, you know, the smaller cap spectrum of the 500. It tends to feel a bit um, like mid cap. Um, and it certainly acts like um, uh, small cap. So if you look at it historically, you see kind of the, the Fama French small cap sector um, it, the, the smaller, you know, decile quartiles kind of historically show stronger performance than the than the than the mig, mega cap. So it is a, a higher cap proxy for the small size factor. Um, I think you you know it, so in, and it acts very much the same as what you'd see out of kind of mid cap or small cap. So when we tend to see small and mid do well, it tends to to coincide with equal weight doing well. Okay. Um, so that, that's how I would answer it first. I mean, in terms of active management um, and, and the impact there, I mean, from, from the Invesco's uh, you know, perspective, obviously we have active, we have you know, passive ETFs. Um, and um, I would say where I operate in the ETF world, where I can you know, speak, um, you know, more uh, with with more confidence and more um, uh, credibility. We have a number of smaller cap strategies that are smart um, and um, you know can can essentially avoid cap weighting. But I would also add to you when you go down the cap spectrum, the the concentration historically has not been as much of a problem because if you think about it, companies in the six hundred get big, they graduate to the four hundred. Companies in the 400 get big, they graduate to the 500. And when in the 500, they got nowhere to graduate to. So they just get, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, it's a great way to think about it. Another question related to ISM. So going back to that part of the presentation, um, any thoughts on kind of looking forward to 2022, 2023 even, supply, supply chain issues all over the news, kind of how you think about that? when those might be resolved and, and the impact on ISM there? Yeah, it's uh, so the impact on ISM has been um, pretty interesting because I would say, personally speaking, um, 
at the kind of the composite level, I would have thought the supply chain issues, which, which are actually pretty prevalent if you read the details of the report, obviously talked about, you know, shows up, I think, in, in some of the, the indicators, has not really impacted at the upper, you know, kind of the composite level. And I think that, I, like, one of the reasons why I like the ISM, because I think it has this um, situation where you, you have sentiment, but there seems to be some very good economic backing to the, to the sentiment here. So I think if the supply chain issues really start to squeeze economic growth, you will start to see it show up more dramatically in the ISM, and that will have some implications for the marketplace. Um, I do think, you know, the inventory cycle, um, you know, kind of the tough year ago comps, um, you know, some of the, 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 the inflationary supply chain pressures, I do think all those things are going to start to pressure that that ISM, like I just don't think the the cycle that we've seen from that indicator is 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 going to dissipate, um, and and so I do look for it to to kind of work its way downward. It'd probably be a slow work downward, but I think that's really the the direction uh, that we're going. And I, I think one reason why I you know I think you have to be constructive in stocks is that just looking at that cycle. You know, usually those things don't just drop off a cliff unless you're, you know, pandemic shock or like it's going it, to a natural cycle. It's going to take time for that ISM to really uh, decelerate. And, and that's probably good news for, for stock prices. All right. Another question for you, kind of particular here to oil and gas now. Um, obviously, the gains we've seen there, um, global energy shortages that are ongoing. Do you see a correction coming maybe after the winter period? Uh, I would say I'm not much of, a, of an energy expert, but I, I would say um, it probably need, uh, the thing I would watch is we need to see more investment. We need to see more signs of output. And, you know, I, I think if you get through the winter period comfortably uh, and you see some of that, then I think you're going to get a bit of a correction. I think if we remain kind of capital starved and, and OPEC is stubborn, um, you know, the prices could stay very, very high. I mean, I think one of the side effects of the ESG phenomena that, that is present is, is, is in, in the, the oil companies, the oil drillers, they've been a little bit less aggressive in terms of their investment programs. And that could lead to, uh, you know, still high prices. And it, and it may take that kind of high price to, um, you know, really destruct demand and, and, and start, you know, I, the implication would be that would be a problem for um, economic activity. And that's certainly what happened in before, you know, 2007, 2008, we don't really talk a lot about the financial crisis, but high energy prices were, um, you know, they, they did play a role. I mean, I think one thing I would, I would just also think about when you look at energy, what I find interesting is energy stocks look a bit cheap relative to, let's say, a 24 month WTI strip. Um, you know, a price to book, price to sales, they, they look fairly depressed on a valuation basis. Um, and uh, it seems like the markets have been a little bit, you know, maybe it's some of the ESG biases, maybe it's, you know, the past poor performance since 2008, you know, X the last year, people seem to be shying away from that. Um, but if energy stocks look attractive on a valuation perspective. And I would say the same thing is true about uh, financials. They look kind of cheap at the bottom end of that range. If you look at, you know, kind of a, a PE uh, a ratio, or um, you start looking at price to book, and so those are interesting areas of of the uh, of the market in terms of uh, of valuation, and it's maybe uh, you know something that uh, peaks uh, kind of peaks people people's interest in in value stocks, which tend to sit in financials and energy. One last question for you. Maybe just have a little fun here. You talked about the top 10 weights in the S&P 500, how that has evolved uh, every 10 years or so. If we were to have this conversation 10 years from now, which of those companies on that list of the top 10 do you think might not be on that list? <laughs> that is, uh, I wish I was that good to, to be quite, quite, quite honest with you. Um, I, I think I don't I don't even know. I, I haven't really given it a lot of thought, but I think you know the interesting thing is to probably look at those growers in the in the mid cap space that are 
are are are present and and try to pick a couple of those horses as opposed to trying to uh, uh, to say that uh, a Tesla or a Facebook is is going to disappear. I, you, right. you, kind of, you stumped the chunk on that one. I, I got to. I, I I don't have a good answer for that. Good answer. Good answer. All right. Well, thank you again for your time. Really do appreciate it. Thank you everyone for your time as well. And thanks for joining. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, please visit widecharts.com for more information on the tool. Um, Invesco has been a great partner of ours. Thank you, Nick, for your time here and uh, have a great rest of the day, everyone.